Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. The COVID-19 pandemic has torn across the globe in a matter of months, upending society and leading to about 330,000 deaths so far. It has also demonstrated how different countries with different political systems deal with a very similar challenge and how the public reacts. So on Monday's episode, we discussed the ways in which the coronavirus response has settled into our existing partisan divide in the United States. Republicans have urged a speedy reopening, while Democrats have urged caution. Concern about the spread of the virus and adherence to social distancing precautions are also, according to the data, partisan. Meanwhile, the details of the response have largely been left to the states. But that's not necessarily how things are going worldwide. So to provide some context for our experience in the United States, today we're going to take a look at the politics of coronavirus abroad, in particular in Europe and China. And here with me to do that are political science professor at the University of Richmond, Don Chen. She researches authoritarian politics and public opinion in China. Hi, Don. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Galen. Nice to be here. Also here with us is Politico Europe analyst Cornelius Hirsch. He's also the founder of the Poll of Polls website, which tracks public opinion across Europe. Cornelius, thanks for being here. Hi, Gail. Thanks for having me on. So let's begin with Europe, which is perhaps a more direct comparison to the United States because of its multi-party democracies. So Cornelius, has the response to the coronavirus pandemic broken down along partisan lines in Europe? No, interestingly, uh, not so much. We've seen very high, uh, very high support by the public for all the measures that have been taken. And also there has been um, a sense of consensus across party lines that those confinement measures to contain the, uh, the spread of the virus are necessary. Um, and what we've seen across Europe uh, and across all, basically all member states is a significant boost for the partisan government and also for the leaders. This rally around the flag effect that uh, you are also familiar with, obviously, as uh, and all 538 listeners are, um, yeah, led both to increasing job approval ratings uh, for heads of governments and also a bounce in general election polls, which we track uh, at political poll of polls. So can you give us a little more context for how high approval ratings are in Europe for countries' leaders? Well, this differs uh, significantly, but um, <clears throat> interestingly, it doesn't matter really which side of the political spectrum the governing parties or the leaders are, um, whether they all saw their numbers improve. So whether the Social Democrats in Sweden or the Christian Democrats in Germany or also the right-wing National Conservative uh, governing party in, in Poland, they all saw their um, their numbers improve in, in the polls. Uh, interestingly, for example, uh, also in Italy, uh, Giuseppe Conte has had has seen um, approval ratings, job approval ratings of how he's handling the crisis uh, of uh, over 70%, which is in, um, extraordinarily high for an Italian politician and is highly interesting. Um, similar high numbers in, um, enjoys also Angela Merkel in Germany. Um, the more polarized France has seen uh, lower approval numbers for uh, Emmanuel Macron, but also he experienced a significant bounce um, and boost in the approval ratings. And I know that different European countries implementing implemented varying degrees of lockdowns at different times. What caused those differences? Did that depend on the party in power or did it depend on something else? Um, not really. So eventually, almost all EU member countries ended up with more or less the same very strict confinement measures. Um, non-essential movement was banned, schools closed, um, non-essential shops closed, and wearing face masks is uh, mandatory on public transport and, and also in shops across uh, lots of countries. Um, but the timing, as you said, um, that differed, uh, differed significantly. At the end of February, um, early March, um, Public big events were suspended across Europe, but then the next bold steps and to try to contain the spread of the virus, um, they were taken. And when they were taken, that's very crucial. And that also, that also affected how the crisis unfolded in, diff in different countries. Um, because one reason for why Germany got through this crisis or this, this first wave, so a wave of the pandemic so well, um, of course, in addition to their healthcare system and the, uh, the good cap testing capacities already early on, is just the fact that they had two uh, crucial weeks more time before the virus hit with full force compared to, for example, Italy and France. 
Um, and you know, those, those were two important weeks and they really used this time um, to increase testing capacity. And other countries such as Austria or uh, the Czech Republic, they acted around the same time, um, but uh, relatively compared to how much the virus had already spread, they were uh, really early adopters of those strict confinement measures. And we clearly see in Europe that the earlier and the stricter the measures were and um, the better those countries got through this first wave of the coronavirus pandemic with lower death toll. And those countries like the uh, Czech Republic and also Austria are now those who are um, the, were also the first ones to be able to open up the economy gradually. Interesting. So it didn't really fall into a, a similar left-right polarized spectrum that it has in the United States. Don, I'm curious, China, of course, doesn't have any formal opposition, but that doesn't mean there isn't any dissent. So right. what if any divides have emerged over the coronavirus response in China? So at the beginning of the outbreak, um, there were sharp criticisms, even, you know, in, in online public opinion, um, about the initial cover up and incompetence of the local party secretaries in, uh, in Wuhan and Hubei. So at the very beginning of the outbreak, we do see very visible public outcry and anger, uh, which is not common in China. Um, however, as the central leadership took control of the pandemic and implemented really, you know, draconian strict measures, and they were able to get the situation under control uh, in a in a fairly short amount of time. Um, so, you know, fast forward to you know March and April, we do see public opinion sort of um, coalesce. And we do see many people feel satisfied or even proud that the Chinese government, the central leadership, was able to weather this challenge. So I see some commonality um, with the European public opinion here, um, sort of the high support for the central leadership. Now, in China, the context is a little bit different, too, because um, in Chinese public opinion research, one fairly well established finding is that the political trust in the central government is higher than that in the local governments. Um, and that seems to be opposite to the situation in many democracies. So you have this pattern of sort of central good, local bad. Yeah, definitely the opposite of what we've seen in the United States during this pandemic, which is sky high approval ratings for local governors, right. and then, you know, disapproval of the federal government's response overall, majority uh, disapproving of the federal government's response. Absolutely, because because Americans tend to distrust this federal government that's far away, that's in DC, and they trust their local governments that's more close uh, to them. So in China, it's the opposite. So that context um, turned out to be a favorable condition for the central leadership to manipulate the narrative at the beginning of the outbreak. So they basically blamed local party secretaries, the local leaders, um, for, for the initial cover up. And, and then after that, the central leadership sort of stepped in and, um, you know, implemented all the measures and was able to get the situation under control. Um, so I see the, the similarity with regards to the high support for the national leadership uh, in China as well as in Europe. I, I saw a lot of questions in at least the American press early on saying that this could be Xi Jinping's undoing. This could foment a kind of dissent in China that hasn't been seen in a long time. Has that happened at all? And if not, why? Yeah, I think... In answering this question in, in late May 2020, I think the answer is, is, is obvious that, you know, Xi Jinping himself, uh, has successfully weathered this challenge, at least domestically. Um, although at the very beginning, we do observe some sort of wobbling in terms of the response from the central leadership. So back in January, um, in late January, uh, Xi Jinping himself actually disappeared from, uh, you know, the, the headlines in, in news broadcasts and the front pages of newspapers for a couple of days. 
And that's when you know the outbreak just started and things were really bad. He actually appointed the number two leader in China, the Chinese premier, to be uh, to be the face, uh, to, to be uh, the central leadership's response uh, to fight the pandemic. Um, however, in early February, uh, Xi Jinping sort of reemerged into the center stage, possibly because there were uh, clear signs that things were started to be put under control, that Xi Jinping felt confident enough to, to reemerge and become the public face. Uh, of the central leadership again. Um, so he reemerged. He visited um, several neighborhoods and medical centers in Beijing uh, wearing a face mask. And, um, you know, in one sort of this choreographed uh, visit performance, he submitted his wrist uh, to a nurse to have his temperature taken. So I think those kind of performance really showed that he is vulnerable to the virus like everybody else is and he also has to go through the the testing the screening if he wants to visit someplace just like everybody else is um, so i think he was very uh, uh careful in crafting this image of a populist leader that has a solidarity with the common people um, so from there um, his leadership i think uh, sort of the message from the central leadership has become more consistent. Um, so the narratives from the state media mainly focused on how the central government has invested, you know, all the resources, um, you know, really take this seriously and, you know, do all that it can to fight the pandemic. Um, and towards late March and early April, when China got the situation under control and when countries in Europe and the United States started to see the outbreak, um, you know, the confirmed cases rising, that's when the state media started to push the narrative that China is, is a leader, is a success, that it can lend its own experience to other countries. Um, so I think the narrative changes somewhat as the pandemic develops. Yeah. Was there ever an acknowledgement of fumbling at the beginning? Like, did anybody get fired? How, because there was dissent that clearly made it across mainland China in the sense that, you know, Dr. Li Wenliang, for example, right. was, you know, censored and so on and ultimately died. Mm -hmm. How did the Chinese government deal with what seemed to be clear missteps at the beginning and maybe more than missteps kind of covering up the situation, denying the facts and not being transparent. Right. So they, the central leadership were able to basically use scapegoats. Um, the local party secretaries in Wuhan and Hubei who were, who were removed from their positions and there were new uh, party secretaries appointed to, to Hubei and Wuhan. So by punishing these local leaders, um, I think that's the response that the central leadership give to the public. Um, with regards to Dr. Li Wenliang, um, unfortunately, he was he was a censor at the beginning. Um, after he died, uh, the local public security bureau gave out a, a, a public statement, um, basically trying to reinstate uh, Dr. Li Wenliang's status. Um, but that wasn't satisfactory uh, to many people in China. So I think there's still some level of public anger, uh, especially with regards to Dr. Li Wenliang. Interesting kind of public opinion shaping and responses in both of these parts of the world that have also been hit pretty hard. Cornelius, there wasn't a partisan response. Was there at all a kind of regional or socioeconomic divide in terms of how Europe has handled the crisis or how the public has responded to its handling of the crisis? Um, well, a more recent development are also those protests that are happening also in, in Europe against the COVID-19 policies. And, and it's quite interesting who is taking it to the streets and the anger against um, those lockdown measures to the streets. Um, because in the, in the recent weeks, we've seen anti-lockdown protests uh, primarily in Germany, the UK, in, in Austria, but also in Poland, Italy and, and France. And the biggest protests, they took place um, in, in some regions of Germany with a few thousand participants in several cities. 
And those protests are a confused alliance of a few moderate concerned uh, pro-business liberals, I'd call them, um, some anti-vaccine activists, and, and then left-wing prote protesters, and to an increasing extent, also far-right extremists. And more recently, we see that the far-right parties are also pushing um, those protests on social media against the lockdown measures, and as well trying at the same time to refocus the debate towards their home base, home base of topics, which is obviously um, the migration topic. And interest interestingly, those protests are stronger in those countries um, that have been more successful in containing the virus and have, been, uh, and have seen lower cases and death numbers. Uh, because this, of course, helps also um, those groups to play the narrative that the media and the elites are overreacting to the virus, that it's not that bad, the coronavirus, or, or that it's even just a hoax. But is that representative at all of more support for those parties, you know, for example, far right parties or even far left parties in Europe? Uh, no. Um, as mentioned before, the search and approval ratings for leaderships, governments, and governing parties was universal. So regardless of where on the political spectrum they, they were or are. Um, but we've seen in approval ratings and also in uh, general election polls, uh, two party groups losing support overall. And those were the far-right parties uh, who lost on average across all EU member states, even, the, um, even when we include those who are in government. And um, that's driven mainly by the fact that their main topics where they uh, are trusted and uh, are not on the front pages anymore. Migration is not as much as a concern at the moment in light of the pandemic uh, threat. But the other group, interestingly, so not only the far right parties have, have lost support um, on average, but also the green parties um, have lost on average across the EU as also the climate issue seems to be less of a concern right now. But this is likely to, to change again, given the extremely dry spring we had here in Europe uh, and making bad harvests and draft um, an unpleasant reminder, actually, of, of that the climate crisis didn't stop because of the coronavirus. But those two groups um, are the ones that we see um, that have lost support in the polls, while interestingly, the center parties, which, which are in general on a long term decline in Europe, so the Social Democrats and the center Christian Democratic uh, parties have has seen some um, some increasing support again. Interesting. Um, but but now we also see that uh, the first signs that some of the leaders are, uh, leaders are coming under increasing scrutiny. So in the response in general, in the United States, embrace of public health experts has been hot and cold on the federal level, sometimes being more embraced than others, sometimes being shunned altogether. What role have public health experts played in the European and Chinese responses? Has there been a wholesale acceptance? Yeah, this pandemic was really as well the, the hour of experts and scientists. Uh, basically, all heads of governments presented themselves on TV screens together with leading scientists and doctors and have also listened to their advice. And uh, some of those virologists um, have, have actually developed almost some kind of stardom now with their own daily podcasts and really high trust from, from people. So uh, this, has been, this has been quite fascinating to see. Now, basically everyone now has his, favor his or her favorite virologist that they listen to, uh, and they have really seen um, their voices being heard, uh, not only uh, by the by the, by the governments or the leaderships, but also by 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 people across Europe. Um, very similar. The 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 trust, the respect for scientists, um, is is you know is predominant among the public, and you you rarely see um, skepticism of scientists in China. Um, Although when, when you have this new virus, when the science is still catching up, we're still trying to understand, you know, what this is and how, you know, to develop vaccines and treatments. There may be some sort of unconfirmed, um, um, grapevine information about potential cures that are not scientifically supported. Um, you may see that kind of information circulating, but with regards to, you know, your trust, in the information coming from the scientists, um, I think there, there's very little skepticism. Yeah, that makes me curious. We talked about conspiracy theories on this podcast last week, and 30% of Americans, it turned out, believe that there is some kind of conspiracy theory surrounding the origin or severity of the virus. What role have conspiracy theories played in public opinion in China? Um, there's certainly 
some room uh, for conspiracy theories to grow. Um, and the Chinese government also has, you know, interest in, in promoting some of the conspiracy theories to deflect international criticism um, of China. Um, so, you know, some even some diplomats from the Ministry of Foreign, Foreign Affairs, they publicly promote conspiracy theories through their personal Twitter accounts or in their, you know, briefings. Um, so, so, so these theories are circulating. Um, but I think overall, the consent is that, you know, we still don't know the true origin of this virus. Cornelius mentioned that there are some regional or maybe even socioeconomic divisions amongst a minority of Europeans. You know, even now that you've described there being a general consensus about the central government's response, are there any breakdowns across like urban or, or rural or socioeconomic lines in China? Yes. Um, based on the reporting from uh, New York Times, for example, we do see that the you know people who tend to be more vocal with their criticism are you know urban educated professionals who may have access to uh, information from foreign media outlets. Um, and these people tend to be more vocal in their criticism of the government. Um, and also these people tend to come from areas that are hit hard by the virus. Uh, so there may be some geographical variation with regards to public opinion. People from Wuhan and Hubei may have a more critical view of the government than people from other provinces, which, you know, where the situation may not be as serious as Hubei. Um, you may also see the divide between education, between rural and urban. So basically people who have more access to information, you know, people who know more about what's happened uh, may be more critical. Um, for people who are less educated, who are in rural areas, um, you know, for them, you know, they may be more concerned with how to get over this crisis, right, and resume their normal life. Um, you know, they may be worried about their livelihood, uh, for example. Um, so there are both regional and a socioeconomic divide uh, with regards to people's opinions. Yeah. Now that we're in kind of a new stage of this crisis and we're talking about, you know, opening up some of these lockdowns, contact tracing digitally, you know, mask wearing, socially distancing in public going forward, these have become somewhat flashpoints as well in the United States. And I'm curious whether or not, you know, pol political flashpoints, really. And I'm curious whether or not that has been the case in either China or Europe. Maybe let's start with China. Um, so there has been very little resistance against, um, you know, contact tracing using technology. You know, you're basically giving up a lot of your, your, your privacy uh, in, in exchange for uh, security, right? And before the pandemic happened, there was actually some debate, some discussion about digital surveillance in China, and people seems to be more concerned with their privacy. They, you know, they were more careful when using their cell phones, for example. Um, but when the pandemic hit, um, you know, in light of this widespread public fear about how serious the situation can get, I think most people were compliant. Uh, when they have to submit their, you know, personal information, where they went and, you know, their temperature, things like that. So I don't yet see uh, widespread resistance against these government measures in the name of, um, you know, controlling the pandemic. I would definitely say that also in Europe, um, at, uh, at the peak of the crisis, people um, also in surveys clearly said that uh, their their health goes over their private privacy or their privacy rights. Um, when also when it came to those um, the, those apps and and contact tracing apps and so on. Um, and they've uh, also in 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 Europe we have this tradition of of a willingness to uh, obey to to those two recommendations by by the government. Um, and and now when it comes to how to open up, it's been actually quite quite interesting also. Um, that 
the European Commission, for example, really wanted to be that the departure from the coronavirus lockdown measures, that they, those are more uh, synchronized than uh, at the beginning when all uh, countries just took measures, uh, steps, measures in their own hands. And, um, and uh, kept, but once again, now also when it comes to the exit strategies, capitals across Europe have really taken those, uh, those matters into their own hands again. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that has been quite similar actually. We've been talking a lot about public opinion here in kind of a similar way that we would talk about public opinion in the United States. And our listeners know kind of how we come to our conclusions about what public opinion is here in the United States based on a whole bunch of different firms that do polling uh, in different states and nationally. And so to maybe get a little more wonky here for a minute, I'm curious about how public opinion is gauged in you know, Europe, for example, but also maybe especially China, um, is public opinion polling generally allowed? Can anybody do it? Are there, how do you come to conclusions about what public sentiment is there? Um, in China, the kind of frequent reliable polling on very specific issues, for example, um, it doesn't exist in China and there are strict government, uh, sort of regulations as to who can conduct surveys in China. Typically, you need to have a local partner, um, typically local universities, um, to actually administer a survey. Um, with that being said, um, we do have access to, to some data, uh, some reliable nationally representative data to understand public opinion in China. So, so there are um, multi-country projects such as World Values Survey, um, Asian Barometer Survey. So these projects all include China. Um, beyond that, there are also sort of one-time surveys. So for example, 2008 China Survey uh, conducted by Texas A&M uh, was an example. And Renmin University in China uh, also conducts uh, Chinese general social survey regularly. And I think their most recent release uh, was the survey done in 2015. Um, so you can get access to those data as well. Um, you know, the, the downside of these large national representative survey is that sometimes the questions that you want to ask are not included in the survey. Um, so some scholars also do their own sort of a smaller scale survey for their specific research projects. And they may focus on just one or two cities or provinces. Um, and in more recent years, uh, we also start to see many scholars use online survey experiments um, to try to understand public opinion in China. Um, so, so yes, we don't have the kind of, you know, the abundance of polling data in China, but we do have some access uh, to reliable data. And what are response rates like? Are people hesitant to talk about potentially dissenting views? Um, like, do you trust the, the data that you get out of these polls? Um, for the surveys I mentioned, yes, I do. Um, I, I, you know, the scholars who were uh, in charge of the survey, you know, they use, you know, very rigorous sort of survey sampling methods. Um, with regards to response rate, um, I can speak about that based on one of my own research projects that I did with my co-author, Andrew McDonald. So we did this lab in the field survey experiment in Xi'an and Guangzhou. And we were fortunate that, you know, we found local partners and we were able to hire student assistants to help us field the survey. The response rate was around 30%. Uh, so what we did was we went to, we went to public places like shopping malls, uh, public parks, squares, you know, where people tend to concentrate. And um, most people, they would say no. And most people are not comfortable talking to strangers about, you know, their views of the government. Um, but, but nonetheless, we were able to carry out the survey and the response rate was about uh, 30%. And, um, and I do think the data were reliable uh, in the sense that people do say what they think of the government. And if they don't feel comfortable sharing their views, um, you know, they have the option of choosing, you know, don't know or decline to answer. Um, so yeah, that's the situation. 
What about in Europe? I, we sometimes knock uh, British polling as being not particularly reliable, but more broadly, <laughs> is European polling reliable? Yeah, when uh, when we talk about the UK, um, you know, we did last year, there were European Parliament elections, and I'm quite happy that for the next European Parliament election, we don't have to use uh, UK polls uh, anymore because there were indeed were some, some issues in the past. But overall, I definitely say that polls are as reliable in Europe as they are in the US. Um, also, a lot of the names or pollsters that you know in the US also have branches in, in several EU countries. Uh, for example, like Qatar, Ipsos, EFOP, YouGov, they have branches in several um, EU countries. And after each national election, um, we at uh, Politico always estimate also the polling error for each uh, uh, pollster and, and each poll ahead of the election. And on average, our poll of polls misses each party by, I would say, less than 2%. Um, so that's actually better than the historical average. But um, of course, there are some um, issues with uh, pluralistic, the pluralistic media landscape and also with, with the transparency, transparency um, around polls in some countries. Um, for example, we, we sometimes have to question the independence of some pollsters in, in, in Hungary, which have close ties to media outlets that, are, that again, have close ties uh, to the ruling party. But then if definitely overall, um, the, the, the polls in Europe can be compared to, to the US, both in accuracy and also the way they are conducted. So is it fair to say, are you Austrian Nate Silver? <laughs> uh, I, I I would say I'm not as good as in poker uh, than Nate Silver. That's that. That so I'm not sure if that's a fair comparison. And can I add something more about sort of the reliability of the data? So so there there are actually some studies in 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 the field of Chinese public opinion about whether we can trust when people say that they they support the government or they're satisfied with the government because they are living under an authoritarian you know society and there may be social desirability issues um I don't think there's a consensus yet as to how much we can trust those data some studies do show that you know the high trust that Chinese people have in the government is probably solid. Um, that's probably their true opinion. Um, there are also some studies that cast doubt on how much we can make of those data because we do have um, a fairly large percentage of don't knows. And how do we interpret those who answer don't know? Um, do they really support the government or do they not? Um, it's hard to know. So, so I think they're there may be some areas of skepticism as to how much we can make of the data. Um, but overall, I think it's safe to say that the general patterns of, you know, the high trust in the central government is is probably solid. What kinds of numbers do you get when you poll the public in China about trust in central government versus local government? So, um you know, depending on the survey, depending on the year, uh, the numbers may may change a little bit. But in general, the trust in the central government would probably be somewhere between 80 to 90 percent. Um, and the trust in their local government would be somewhere between 60 to 70 percent. So that's still a fairly high number. But there there are, you know, this consistent gap uh, between trust at the central and the local levels. So when it comes to public opinion, one thing that's going on in the United States right now is that across party lines, Republican, Democratic, there is increasing distrust of China. And it's likely going to be something that plays out in this 2020 general election. Has there been something similar going on in Europe? And kind of given that Europe is maybe uh, a third party in between some of the spats going on between China and the United States right now, what is public opinion polling like when you compare views of the United States and China right now in Europe? Yeah, that's that's an incredible, uh, interesting question. Um, because actually here in Europe, the distrust um, against the United States has, has increased um, recently even more. Um, there's, there's been one very recent poll by the Kerber Foundation um, that was, I think, conducted in early April, um, um, only in, in Germany. But there, 73% of, of respondents said that the pandemic has worsened their view of the US. 
And at the same time, um, this survey, survey also showed that Germans are now almost equally divided uh, on whether Washington or Beijing um, is the more important partner for Germany, which is quite a, a dramatic shift and also given the, the, the history of, of Germany uh, and the alliance between uh, Europe, NATO, Germany and the US. Um, and th yeah, as I said, this, this really represents a significant, uh, a significant shift um, compared uh, to the same survey that was done in, in September when Germans, Germans still gave um, the United States a clear um, favoring uh, figure in this, in this poll, uh, whether Washington or Beijing is the more important partner. Um, but this does not mean that Germans are giving China kind of a free pass. There's still a lot of skepticism about also how um, the Chinese central government tried to cover up um, the beginning of the of the outbreak in, in, in Wuhan. And another caveat around this, this survey is also that um, the United States uh, or the people in, in Europe also hold the United States to a higher standard and are uh, thus more easily, I would say, disappointed when, when Washington fails than when Beijing um, fails them. And um, moreover, all the Germans have been very critical about the current U.S. government before, already before the coronavirus. Um, and if we want to speak about Europe overall, um, there is kind of, also this survey fits into a pattern or in, into, a, into a development that we see um, that there is a general desire of Europeans for more autonomy and serenity. Um, because also other surveys find that uh, Europeans increasingly want to be more independent at a global stage and don't want to necessarily have to pick sides in uh, international disputes. So this is, this is really interesting. And also um, regarding the view of China, China has really ramped up the propaganda war um, uh, over, over the last month in, in Europe as well. We've seen um, they've been accused of misinformation um, strategies in social media, uh, but also quite openly, Be Beijing has been engaging in a not so subtle PR uh, campaign, so to say, and really with the strategy to, to distract from the fact that the, the virus started in China and that also the government in the beginning tried to cover it up for weeks. Um, and now they've, they've uh, also already in March, China has sent plane loads of, of masks, medical equipment, teams of doctors and even, even ventilators to uh, European countries that were, were hit the hardest um, to really make up uh, for, for what has happened in the beginning also, and also to present themselves at the world stage as, 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 a, as an alliance or as, a, as an ally. Um, so China sent, yeah, as I said, planes with, with, with masks and, and, and medical gear um, very early on when the EU seemed, uh, especially the EU commission seemed quite unprepared and caught on the wrong foot with this pandemic. So, um, and this, 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 uh, this plane loads of medical equipment and help from China definitely also had an impact on, on uh, how China has been seen uh, in comparison to the US. But this is uh, a dramatic shift that we are seeing uh, overall in Europe when it comes to um, international alliances. Interesting. I think it's fair to say at the moment, given the mantra of America first and just general rhetoric coming out of the federal government, State Department, that the United States' number one priority is not kind of how it's viewed abroad or its traditional alliances, given, you know, some skepticism about NATO, even that was emphasized a lot early on in Trump's yeah. administration. Yes, and this and this shows in and this shows in the in the approval numbers of of and the trust numbers by Europeans in the U.S. government as well. Yeah, Don, it seems like the Chinese central government has been able to get domestic public opinion on its side, but now the question is whether it can get international opinion on its side. What's your take on the government's ability to do that? Yeah, I I agree that domestically the the worst has passed in terms of the central leadership's, um, you know, image and how the people react to the government's handling of this outbreak. However, the next challenge is how to recover the economy. Um, you know, livelihood is a key issue uh, in Chinese politics. And, you know, for example, now is a graduating season and we have a very large number of college graduates and whether they can find employment after graduation would be, would be a political challenge for, for the government. So, so I think even though the public health crisis is put under control, the next step is to, <clears throat> is to make sure that the economy is recovering 
at a fast pace.、Um, internationally, I think the public opinion environment is less optimistic, and I think the central leadership is is keenly aware of that.、Um, so that's why you know you see Xi Jinping this week, for example,、uh, attending WHO conference and pledging two billion dollars to to the to this organization and trying to take the void of international leadership that the Trump administration has、uh, ceded. So. So I think all of these fairly aggressive diplomacy, including sending medical equipments and doctors to other countries, I think all of this was to make sure that the international environment、um, is sort of is not too hostile、uh, towards China. But whether that's successful or not, I think it remains to be seen. What about some of the political challenges facing Europe going forward? It's been a boon, as you mentioned, to sitting governments across the continent. But you know, now with opening up and a struggling economy, and also seemingly a lot of criticism of how the European Union federal government responded to the crisis, what is at stake now going forward? Yeah, definitely. So those really high approval ratings,、uh, ratings, we see some first signs that they're that they're、uh, decreasing again.、Um, but this will definitely, and I think this is a pattern we see across the world, whether China, U.S., or Europe, this will largely depend on the economic development in the coming months as Europe enters、uh, one of the worst economic crises, and、um, we already see the un- unemployment figures rising. And then also this first take that I gave that far right parties are at the moment. Losing,、uh, losing in in the polls, that might be、uh, reversed, right? When 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 the economic、uh, crisis really hits,、um, but really interesting is is also、um, the the economic response. I've mentioned、uh, already that we have these different country tribes, kind of, and that that's rather along geographic lines and not so much ar- along、uh, party lines. Wh- what economic response? Um, or policies those different governments、um, favor, but we've seen a really huge development actually this week in 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 Europe with、uh, Germany or the government of Germany,、um, which was traditionally counted to the frugal countries, so rather uh,、um, pro austerity measures and and、uh, yeah a very a very frugal economic、uh, response. The German government this week backed for the first time、uh, European common European borrowing,、uh, which some observers call almost like a Hamilton moment for the European Union.、Uh, if this French German proposal, those two countries propose this this、um, common borrowing together, if this proposal is successful, because、um, that would really be a huge step if for the first time the European Union would、um, would issue bonds together and would、uh, do common borrowing. And that would be a huge integration step, actually. So,、uh, really interesting, also economic developments here in 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 the European Union. I know that you know I've seen reports of some you know anti democratic European governments taking advantage of the coronavirus in order to consolidate power. I mean, do you think maybe this is a difficult question to answer, but? Has democracy in Europe,、uh, writ large, become more attractive or less attractive as a result of this pandemic? And I'll say that in the United States, you know, interestingly enough, particularly among young people, democracy we've seen has grown less popular.、Uh, you know, which for a lot of Americans seems super surprising, given that we consider ourselves proudly the oldest democracy、uh, in the world. How has This incredible challenge、uh, shaped Europeans' perspective and the reality of democracy. I think this can't be answered right now already. Whether this pandemic has really had a lasting effect on on how democracy is viewed, but you are right. We've seen、um, several governments are、uh, taking the opportunity or you seizing this this moment to crack down. Uh, on the media, even more.、Uh, for example, the Freedom House report now does not、uh, consider Hungary a full democracy anymore for the first time, and、uh, Hungary is a full member of the European Union, which、uh, sees itself as a democratic,、uh, as a union of democratic states. So this is a huge challenge, but also something that is not new. But、uh, rather, this this crisis has、um, has、uh, increased or the the speed of this development.、Um, interestingly. 
we we see that the trust in institutions has been has been increasing, um, while also in some countries, especially in Italy, um, the trust for or the euro skepticism uh, has been has also been uh, on the rise, especially because the European Union in the beginning failed to to react swiftly and to to um, assist the countries hit the hardest. Um, but the, I think the, def, the final verdict here definitely is still out. So we have this contradicting development of, of um, increasing trust in, in institutions overall, while, um, while at the same time also uh, increasing Euroscepticism and the crackdown on uh, democratic institutions in some countries. Yeah, turning to China, of course, it's a, an authoritarian country, so it's maybe not a question of... Well, I guess you can still ask the same question, because there is dissent and they obviously domestically have views of democracy, whether they have it or not. Um, what has, what, how does democracy look versus authoritarianism in China today? Um, so for if you look at the United States and how the federal government has responded to the pandemic, uh, that would cast this democratic country in a very negative light. And if you compare that with the Chinese government's response, that formed a huge contrast of, you know, not only government leadership, um, but also the effectiveness, the outcome uh, of, of controlling the pandemic. Um, and in, in Chinese state media now, you know, because of Trump administration's criticism of China, um, a lot of the, the rhetoric was also um, about refuting, uh, you know, America and pointing out the weaknesses in the American political system, especially when it comes to uh, the fight against the pandemic. Um, with that being said, countries like Taiwan and South Korea are also democracies, and they have done a pretty good job so far in terms of controlling the pandemic. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the focus of the news reporting uh, in China right now. Um, and so, so all of these factors considered, I think if you live in, in the media environment in China, you probably have a a fairly negative view on the effectiveness of democratic governments uh, in moments like this. I guess we'll see how things go moving forward. As you mentioned, Cornelius, the, you know, the answer is still inconclusive uh, in Europe. But anyway, I think uh, that's all we have time for today. It's been really enlightening to hear about the these different experiences abroad, given that you know, in a matter of months, all of these different countries, all of these different political systems have had to deal with a very similar crisis. So uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Don and Cornelius. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Don. It was really interesting talking to you. Thank you. Don Chen is a political science professor at the University of Richmond and researches authoritarian politics and public opinion in China. And Cornelius Hirsch is a Politico Europe analyst and founder of the Poll of Polls website, which tracks public opinion across Europe. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.